Hi, and welcome back to Textile Talks. I'm Amy Milne. I'm the Executive Director of the Quilt Alliance, and I want to thank you for making time to join us today. I like to think of this series as part of a healthy wellness plan. It supplies an important nutrient that is vitamin P, and that's P for people. <laughs> I'm an extrovert, whether you believe that or not. I'm good at, ex I I'm an introvert rather. I'm good at extroverting, but I'm really an introvert. And even in the best of times, I rely on small doses of vitamin P to keep me happy. Um, for, for me, that means going to the thrift store or walking in a busy park. Um, and when I can, visiting a friend's studio. And now that we're all staying home to be safe from COVID, we have never needed human connections and inspiration more. So keep coming back to this series for your vitamin P. Uh, Textile Talks is a free program at this time made possible by our sponsors list listed here. Uh, visit them. Um, patronize them and remember them. These companies see us nonprofits as important partners and value you as customers. And we are very grateful for their support so we can all supplement our vitamin P each week with a new textile talk. Um, today, we're going to travel to Oregon, Minnesota, California and Connecticut to visit six quilters in their studios. Uh, five of these artists were guests on the Quilt Alliance's interview show called Story Bee. This show is hosted by Francis O'Rourke Dow and there are, over, uh, there are 35 episodes to date. They're all recorded via Zoom. They last about an hour each. And uh, each show includes an interview followed by a tour of the interviewee's workspace. Uh, as you watch these um, excerpts we're gonna show you and, and the other episodes, full episodes online, you have to keep in mind that sometimes the video or the audio quality dips a little bit if there's a network disruption. And sometimes there are unexpected elements like a dog or a cat. There are a lot of pets in these videos. Uh, even a cricket was once on set, and you'll uh, actually get to experience that. Uh, you can adjust your volume settings as needed. Um, feel free to do that. I've tried to keep the levels for the excerpts you're going to see pretty much pretty consistent, but just so you know. Um, the full length, um, let's see, I think I got off one here. Yeah, the, so these full length episodes are offered to all our members and we have short teasers that we share with the public. These are on our YouTube. Uh, this is on our YouTube channel, the teasers that is. Uh, and this is a great benefit of being a Quilt Alliance member. In addition to doing a lot of good in supporting our quilt uh, history work, our documentary work, and I highly recommend you spend the low, low price of $30 to become a Quilt Alliance member um, so that you can binge watch like all your Netflix shows. You can binge watch all 35 episodes of Story B. Um, and this month you'll see a fresh Story B, which is um, Anna Maria Horner is our, is our interviewee. That's our January show. And that comes out on January 23rd. So today we're gonna to watch a 20 minute uh, compilation of five studio visits. Uh, these are the most recent interviews we've done. And you'll hear from Jean Wells in Oregon, Gwen Westerman in Minnesota, Eleanor Burns in California, Lizzie Rockwell in Connecticut, and Kimberly Imo also in California. In most of the tours, you'll get a peek at the artist's work, and in many of them, there's a strong visual tie between the vibe of their space and the look of their work, and that just makes sense. Uh, each artist has created a unique space in which to grow and develop their artistic voice. And after we see these st Story B video excerpts, we'll be joined by Laurie Russman in Connecticut, who is going to give us a live tour of her nurturing workspace, which I think you're gonna love. And you'll have a chance to ask her some questions. 
So let's get started. I'm going to adjust this just a little bit so we can see just the video. I wanted to invite you into my studio. Uh, we've been in our house for 10 years. John and I designed our house and it's actually the first time I've had a real studio in my whole life. So I, I really got to personalize it. And I'm very happy that you're here today. And I'll point out a few things um, as I talk about my quilts too. Um, this is my work table and it literally is like a cabinet because I have drawers and shelves and things underneath. Um, so I really organized all my tools and some storage in here. And then this is my surface for cutting and designing a lot of times. Um, and then I had seen in a magazine where um, a woman had hung hollow cord doors and put um, cork on them and flannel and used them for a design wall. And behind it was her fabric storage. So that's what I've been able to do. And it kind of serves two purposes. It gives me a lot of design room, but it also protects the fabric from the sun. And we live in a very sunny area. So um, I, can, I do have some fading, I notice once in a while, but I don't worry about it. I just cut around it. Well, and uh, I love my fence. Um, there's a woman in town who, uh, does fused glass mm -hmm. and um, she um, did a light fixture for us and she uh, told me about a place where I could get this scrap metal. It's um, they, all those shapes, they've cut pieces out that are used in something and this is the leftovers. And so I went and found four panels and then I had a young man help me uh, designed the fence and uh -huh. then Susie Zeitner um, created my little sunflower panels. Oh, that's amazing. That is a great fence. That's beautiful. And that gate. Well, and, and you can see the Three Sisters Mountains. Huh? And, um, and is that arch is over the gate also metal? Uh huh, it is. Oh, gosh. And I've collected a lot of things like that over the years. That thing's probably 20 years old. Oh, what a beautiful space, Jean. And your studio as well. That is just... Uh. Well, it's really fun to actually have a studio, a dedicated space. Mm -hmm. For years, I just sewed in the basement or at the kitchen table or yeah. wherever I could. Well, this is my workspace. I have a lot of counters and cabinets that were in this house before I moved into it. Uh, I painted the uh, cabinet doors with chalkboard paint so I would know what was in there and be able to keep important dates and ideas um, right at hand. Um, a lot of music. So I have my stereo set up down here as well. And I'm always working on more than one project at once. So I've got a horse mask here and um, that's gonna be a quilted horse mask. So there's that uh, tradition in Plains uh, native life where horses are dressed uh, as well. So this would go over the horse's face and his ears would be sticking out. Um, so a lot of my supplies are right at hand and that helps me stay organized. Um, fabric. Love these wire baskets. And again, everything just kind of color coordinated. Here's my design wall. And 
there are two different projects on this design wall. One is a landscape, but the other things that you see are for a project um, for quilts that I made that reflect war mothers songs. And you know, a lot of people talk about veterans and supporting veterans. But uh, in our Plains Native tradition, the mothers of soldiers and Marines and veterans are honored as well, because in that Plains tradition, uh, people recognize the sacrifice that mothers make sending their children to war. So this has information uh, that I've been using for Tule Lake incarceration camp for Japanese Americans during World War II. There are images of Plains Indian women uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, one of the mothers has a gold star flag as part of her, her uh, blanket, uh, but they're dressed in traditional dress. And uh, yeah. And a mom uh, cut cloth embroidered piece that also helps tell the story of the, the Hmong during the Vietnam War because there's a large Hmong population here in Minnesota. Is that a piece you made, Gwen, or is that a piece that no, you're using for no. inspiration? That's a piece I'm using for inspiration. And then my little awards wall. That always makes me happy. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite music to listen to while you're quilting, Gwen? James Taylor, uh, Carol King, Gloria Stefan. Who else is in there? The Chicks, Shania Twain. <laughs> you're a like your own heart, Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> This is my special place. This is my sewing room, but it's really a classroom because I have two baby block sewing machines set up at a nice big table. I actually have four of these centers just like this. So eight people can sew together. They can sit and talk with each other, but we also do a lot of volunteer work. So it's perfect for teamwork. Well, on the table, I have all of the women that have inspired me, especially in the beginning. The first book I ever got was by Ruby McKim. Ruby McKim's book, I love that one. This is from the Kansas City Star. I did Nancy Page Club. How about some mountain mist patterns? All of those old things. And I also really enjoy getting uncompleted quilt blocks. This is the Dresden Plate. You can see the Dresden plate pattern from um, Mountain Mist. There's the cardboard. So my idea was speed it up, and I made some acrylic templates that are perfect. Nice. Well, well, you ask me what I do besides make quilts. Well, I'd rather make quilts than anything. I am a good cook, but one of my passions is work with my hands at night so I don't fall asleep while I watch TV. And I like to do wool and just do it all hand work. It is pretty amazing when I look back at all of, all of the wool work that I've done. This one with the little basket. Of course, an apple for the teacher. The teacher has to have her apple. Lots of fun. I love history and the quilts that go with them. This is 100 years for women to get the right to vote. And one of their quilt blocks was the temperance block, or it's called the double T. I watched the program on PBS, and I was really surprised to hear about how many of the men were drinking and, and alcoholics and such. So double T, temperance, was great for the women to march. Really fun. So I just love collecting antique quilts any color any size it doesn't matter they don't have to be perfect but i just love antique quilts and i certainly enjoy teaching my students as well thank you okay so francis i'm going to show you and all our 
uh, viewers, my studio. So this is um, one of the bedrooms in my house, which is in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And so I have lots of artwork. Um, I have flat files. Um, there is the recently released Altogether Quilt and some artwork from my book about emotions called How Do You Feel? And then over here is my drawing table. And uh, just to give you the full 360, I have more books and my computer. And oh, what's that? A quilt. This is actually the quilt um, that I made that they make in the book, the Altogether Quilt. So I made the actual quilt. Um, one of the kids, Jocelyn, uh, made that nice artwork with beautiful um, Marvy fabric markers and friends made the handprints and everything. And then lots of folks helped um, hand quilt it at the frame. Uh, but I chose all the fabrics and I made the design um, partly because I wanted the fabrics to tell sort of a, a interesting story. So they're globally sourced. Um, there's a piece by piece poster uh, inviting people to one of our unveilings. And there's another piece by piece poster about another unveiling. Uh, so yeah, Rockwell. That is very cool. 1964. Yeah. And then, oh, Reggie. Reggie. Reggie, <laughs> off, off, off. He knows a new good thing on the ground when he sees it. So this is one of the quilts that um, actually I piece by piece um, quilted it, but I worked with another group of youth in Bridgeport uh, to generate all this artwork. So it has some photographs in it. Um, it has a lot of acrylic paintings. The theme was it's going to go in a library. So I come up with a metaphor, a visual metaphor and a, and a slogan. So in this case, it's open up at the Newfield Library in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I like the, uh, you know, the, the, the metaphor of metamorphosis is always so wonderful. So, and books open up and butterflies open up. And so I had the kids brainstorm what opens up when you go to the library. So they just kind of went to town on it and then each drew their own butterfly um, on paper, which then I printed, you know, onto printable fabric and did that with the photographs too. So this, this was designed for a library, sort of a storefront uh, library branch. And the only wall space was, you know, between the low ceiling and the bookcase. Um, and it was three feet high and 12 feet wide. So that, that was an exceptional uh, challenge. And making the quilt frame for that was also very challenging. And of course, like every quilter, we have a whole bunch of masks. Yes. <laughs> in the works down here. <laughs> I still haven't pleated these, but um, they'll be ready pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah, every, yeah. And then we just like, where do you put all your fabric? Like who has enough room to put their fabric someplace? <laughs> I don't, but it's partly because we brought so many of these projects home to yeah. you know, work on here. So anyway, I think that's, that's about all I need to show you. Well, thank you for sharing your spaces with us. They're wonderful to look at. I love that pink iron. Uh, I won it from the Quilt Alliance. Ah, I am the luckiest gal in America. I won something. Isn't that, oh, that awesome? is so cool. It's a great little travel, um, travel iron. Hey, everybody. Welcome to my studio. I'd love to show you around. And this is Remy, one of our new little kitties. 
and she's real sweet. She's learning from Cheeto how to be a, a great quilting um, inspector. <laughs> but I thought we'd start here because this is literally the front door to our home. And my studio is literally in what was a small living room. And when we bought this house a couple years ago, I decided to take it over because of all the great natural light. Now I thought our, our realtor at the time would have a heart attack when I told them I was going to transform our living room into my studio because it is, it's the first thing that people see when they walk through the door. But this is such a big part of my life as quilting is for most people that I, I say, you know what, there's a couple of rooms in your home that has the, the best lighting and typically it's your living room or your dining room, your formal dining room. A lot of homes used to be um, designed so those would be the um, primo real estate in the, in the house. And there are some people that never entertain anymore in their front parlors or living rooms or they actually only have um, you know, one Thanksgiving dinner a year. If that's the case and you have rooms not being used, you need to reconsider or you should maybe reconsider what you could get it as your studio instead of sharing a spare bedroom or uh, a basement space that doesn't have good light because uh, dining rooms and living rooms often have really good light. So I'll just walk you around here a little bit it's not a large room, but because of being in the military and having moved uh, so many times, 18 times in 31 years, I've done a lot of studios and I've learned a lot in setting up a studio in all of those homes. And so I've learned how to make the most, the best use of every inch of space. And you don't have to have um, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to add cabinetry. There's a lot of things that you can do to make the most of the space that you have. But this is really only 300 square feet. It's not huge by any means, but it does everything I need it to do. So right here in the center is where I have two cabinets. And then we have these, um, these cabinets built in, but we just went to our local Lowe's. And literally, I sat down with um, somebody in the kitchen, uh, the kitchen department, the kitchen cabinets, and I asked for a designer who maybe sewed or crafted or was a quilter and actually worked with a, a lady who was a crafter and she totally got, understood what I was going for. And she worked with the space and worked with me to add these, what would have been kitchen cabinets. And so here, in here I have this is all my hand embroidery and Sasha Co. I have lots and lots of threads. Um, and it's, I try to keep it pretty. Yeah. So the next thing is, is my cutting surface. Now I really like this idea because um, people might not necessarily think about this, but if you go to a home improvement store, they have pre-made kitchen sink units, cabinet units. We put two of them, and this was the idea of that uh, kitchen designer at Lowe's. <laughs> she said, we'll take two bases, two kitchen sink bases, just pre-manufactured, pre put them back to back. There's a flat facade on here, so a thin facade so that you can't see the seam. These are two kitchen sinks back to back, which makes it 36 inches or just about 37 inches wide, which fits two cutting mats back to back. So I have the, two, the mats that are 36 by 24. You can put two mats back to back and it fits beautifully on top of these kitchen sink units. So that was just a brilliant design. She also put them up on casters so this can actually roll. We can actually roll it yeah. and move it when we need to. And then this side has um, a slide out drawers here where I store like my steady beddies or my wooly beddies for mm -hmm. pressing. I've got just uh, stabilizers. It's a little bit messy down there, but my favorite, favorite feature. Oh, you'll love this. This is one of those things where it, in a kitchen sink, you'd pull it open and it holds your sponges or your scrubbies. Mm -hmm. It holds my rotary cutters. Oh, how cool. <laughs> So I've got all my rotary cutters, but this was just a standard kitchen sink base mm -hmm. unit, but it, hold, you know, it just holds those so mm -hmm. I can have everything right here. 
So again, it's all about making mm -hmm. the most uh, use of your space. So I can stand here, grab my rulers, get on my cutting done, and it's at the perfect height for, you know, and the casters help me bring it up to the perfect height for cutting. So I yeah. can stand for long, long periods of time. Oh, that's great. So. I love it. Is it always this clean? Pretty much. Now I'll make it a mess when I'm working. Yeah. But at the end of every day, just as part of my mental um, wrapping things up, preparing for the next day, I will take a half hour or whatever it takes to tidy up. Doesn't mean I'll put everything away, but trash gets emptied, the machine maybe gets cleaned, new thread, you know, make sure there's a new bobbin for the next day. Um, anything laying out will, will get tidied up. I, I don't work well in clutter. I think that's part of the military too. Yeah. It just all those moves have taught me no clutter. Yes. So um, it is. It, well, you would would see it when I'm working with stuff around. It's usually pretty um, organized. I'm a very organized person, and so I I'm not really worried about somebody coming in the front door. And if they do see my stuff out and the ironing board set up and me working, I'm not worried about that because this is who I am. You know, I don't need to hide it. I love that last part. I don't need to hide it. This is who I am. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that little tour. I'm going to pull my uh, slide back out. These are the artists that we visited with. Again, this, these were excerpts. So the full episodes of Story V uh, interview shows that these artists were featured on includes an interview, and then it's followed by a studio tour that's longer. So these are only five minutes each. So that kind of gives you an idea of what it's like. And um, we really enjoy these uh, interviews. Francis is a great interviewer, Francis O'Rourke Dow. And uh, you can see there's such a range in how people, um, not only their studio, but how they prepare their studio for our visit. You know, some people are very meticulous. As Kimberly says, she cleans up every time. With Lizzie, she showed us almost her whole house and there were interesting things in each room. So I hope you enjoyed that. And now I want to invite uh, Laurie Russman to join us live. Um, we had a little bit of a challenge with her webcam, so hopefully that'll be um, straightened out. Laurie, if you wanna go ahead and turn your camera on. There she is. And you're, you've got your audio on. I awesome. do, can you hear me? Thank you for joining us. This is Laurie Russman. And if you know her on social media, you know her as Neon Kitty Quilts. Um, she's a former board member of the Quilt Alliance. The Quilt Alliance is, of course, a nonprofit. We, we say that we are small but mighty, and our board members do a lot. Uh, they contribute a lot, and uh, we were so glad to have Laurie. She's also a member of SACWA, enthusiastic member of SACWA. She lives in Connecticut with her husband and her angelic German shepherd dog and three mischievous felines. And as I read this, my feline is trying to get on my lap. So hopefully she's not gonna sabotage this call, but um, I'll let the, uh, you all just read Laurie's uh, incredible accomplishments here. She's really done a lot and quilting has not been her day job. So it's even more impressive. Uh, given that she's had full-time work uh, during all this, these accomplishments. So that's great. You can see her work on um, her website, neonkittyquilts.com and uh, at neonkittyquilts is her social media profile. And then uh, for the other, I just wanted to mention too, for the other artists that we visited, the studios we visited, Emma's gonna post those websites in the chat box. So if you missed one and you wanna go back and visit their site and see their work, go for it. But please do visit Laurie's site. Now I'm gonna show you just a few pieces of her work um, so that you can get a feel for her work as we go on this tour. She has some of her work um, showing in the studio, but uh, these are two pieces on Chalburn Road and Jake that Laurie shared with me. And uh, I'm sure you're gonna show a little bit more, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. I'm gonna turn off my video and then uh, 
stop sharing here for just a sec. And um, it is all yours, Laurie. Okay, well, folks, thank you so much. Amy, thank you so much for including me today. Uh, it, this is such a treat because this is my favorite place in the entire world. You know, we had some technical difficulties. So if it looks awkward, I'm holding up my iPad because my phone did not work. So cross fingers, everyone, as we switch. Yes, I can actually see. So as Amy mentioned, I live in Connecticut and my loft, my studio is in the loft of our house. So the interesting thing is that we have light overhead from a very high ceiling. You can kind of peek over into the living room. And I hope you take away from today that even if you have a small space, you can do a lot with it because my studio was only 12 by 12, uh, not including that area where my sewing machine table is. I know the ceilings are really high, <laughs> but so if we go in, um, and basically my husband came up with just about everything, the layout and made several of these pieces. For instance, that is my movable design wall from Home Depot. It's a sort of hanging unit with batting wrapped around because as you can see, I don't have very many hmm, walls. So starting here at my cutting table, as you can see, I'm a little rainbow obsessed. And I'm also a little obsessed with batiks. I'm a big user of Wyndham, Wyndham fabrics. I've done a lot of projects with them. So I decided, give you a closer look, to sort all of the colors by berry basket, from blue violet to blue to bluish green, to, well, you know, and so on. So they're right there, already misty fused and ready to grab and cut. And this is a beautiful table that my husband had built for me by a man who does Adirondack style furniture. The dog is usually there, he's shy, but it's high, it's 36 inches high. So you know how important it is to have ergonomic, you know, comfort, have that elbow with the right height. So for my height, this is a very comfortable place to work and cut lots and lots of pieces, which I do because I do raw edged fusible applique. Now my fabric, when we moved into this house, this was part of the built-in, was this shelf unit, which I absolutely love. And so each piece of fabric is really well organized and it really does always look that way. The studio, not so much, it's not usually this clean, but for sanity purposes, I have my fabric sorted by color and then I'll give you a closer look. I'm a big fan of uppercase magazines. So there's all my uppercase magazine issues and the Encyclopedia of Inspiration books. And then some special fabrics like hand dyed fabrics sort of sit there. So I know where to grab for stuff when I need it. I'm also a really big fan of Aurifil thread. You'll see more of it on the other side. So as you can see, being compulsive, I have the color builders right on top of the sort of corresponding stacks of fabric. <laughs> now I'm gonna back away here and show you a piece that really made my studio feel three times larger. And that's my rolling pressing surface. So just like Kimberly showed in that tour with her rolling uh, kitchen cart, cutting, cutting cart that she put together, which I think is brilliant. Um, this is something that Elliot constructed. And if you take a closer look, it's Metro shelving that you can get from Amazon with really strong wheels. So look how much storage there is. There is a lot, a lot of weight on those wheels. All my quilting books, a lot of art quilting supplies. And on the other side, a whole bunch of other stuff. And the best thing about this, and I could do this a little more easily if I wasn't holding the iPad, <laughs> is that it can move around. So 
whatever I'm doing, it can move all the way over to my long arm if I need it handy for holding pins or something else. Another funny feature since we're up here in this loft is that that's an internal window that looks out over into the kitchen. My husband's an incredible cook, so I can peek out and see what's going on for dinner. Thank you. The lighting, <laughs> this we have a lot of lighting overhead built in because there is a challenge if you have a space with, with sloping walls and not very many external windows, it can get dark, uh, so the lighting helps a lot. So I tend to decorate this little area for seasonal stuff. So you can see my little, right now I'm working on a bunch of quilts. I love doing batches of quilts for a project that Jamie Fingal started. And she has art quilters create home themed quilts that go to an agency in California that furnishes apartments for formerly homeless women and kids. And it's just such a wonderful thing to, you know, bring a bit of bright color into somebody's home. You don't know who it'll be, but you just know you're doing something nice for someone. So my current project, as you can see, Jackson, my cat, looms large everywhere. And that's Neon Kitty, who was juried into Houston in 2013 when Pokey did the um, project to benefit the shelter in Houston. And I was so excited that really kind of ignited me from hobby to, you know, not quite full-time passion, but definitely passion. Now here, and by the way, I sent Amy links to three blog posts that I've written about rearranging about building the pressing table and then about the sewing machine table um, to help it might be interesting for you as you think about ways to use your studio space the best. So this table takes up every inch of a really weird space. You see how that ceiling slopes there? If you look at the corner, you see where I've stored little scraps of fabric in the little gelato containers. This space was a mess before, but by building a giant desk, takes every inch, makes it useful either to hold a quilt, or in my case, to hold a lot of other appliances, like my new digital cutter, which is great by the way. And underneath here, it does create room for rolling storage. So more Metro shelves there to hold some Walmart shelving. Uh, that would be, let's see, my art supplies and lots and lots of Aurifil thread. And then over here, lots and lots of thread. And you know, I kind of get out of control, but I'm an Aurifil fanatic, but it's not just Aurifil. I'm a wonderful uh, thread instructor now too. Oh man, it, it's, it's just such a fun passion to have. Now, as I mentioned, built-ins in our house, one of the other cool things was that there was a molding over the space. Now, how they could have known it would be the perfect width for a spool of our full thread, we don't know, but it is. And <laughs> I know those gelato containers are great, right? And then on the fourth side, finally, is my long arm. Let me step away a little bit here. Now, a lot of you may be thinking, oh, I couldn't possibly fit a long arm into my space. It's too small. Well, think about it. This is a 12 by 12 square with little extra spot. The challenge I found initially with this table is that I had it set up for an eight foot studio table and one of the things I write about in one of those blog posts. So I realized that A, I didn't need to be that wide and B, I was able to pull it up, push it up against a wall. If you look at long arm quilters, some people like to get around to the back uh, to do pantographs, but that's not something that I would use. So this handy quilter sits on a studio table that's a four foot and a two foot table put together. And as you can see, it really doesn't take up that much space. And again, every inch is used. So 
my Bernina case, yarn, Lord knows what else is under there, packing materials. So no space goes to waste. And sometimes the surface is just a good home to put baskets of work in progress. And then there's the entrance again. So we've gone 360 and I'd love to answer any questions about any of these parts of the studio. That Mari, thank you. That your space is so beautiful. What an inspiration. I hope everybody enjoyed that. And I'm sure you've got questions. Um, I have a couple questions first. Um, do you want to turn your um, camera around? Um, my first question is, is this your dream studio? And if not, how close are you? <laughs> oh, it, it's, it's pretty close. I think if I could just put a magic sound bubble around it, as I mentioned to you the other day, the funny thing about this loft is that it's shared space because Elliot's office is on the other side. And since we look over the living room, the, the, the not so musical tones of the long arm dentistrial sound go sort of wafting over into the living room area. So <laughs> I need to be a little thoughtful about when I'm making a lot of noise. Um, so I would put like, you know, sort of magical sound barriers around. But I think having a space this small is a really good discipline because I think if you have too much space, there's just a, you know, a temptation to just have more and more shelves and more and more space. And uh, I have to be really disciplined about giving fabric away once I'm pretty sure I'm not going to use it and thread the same thing. So um, I would say this is 95%. That's amazing. That's uh, we interviewed uh, Latifa Safir, and she has a really small workspace um, because of her living arrangements right now. And she said the same thing that it, you know it's really kind of a it's a good design problem to give yourself as a creative person mm -hmm. to have a um, smaller space to work with. Um, so here's another question, and then I'll put um, bring in some questions from other folks. Um, how did your previous studio spaces inform your current space? Um, what did you learn from spaces that you worked in before this one? Well, I, I had sort of a studio before. Um, previously, we were in New York City and we used to have a little weekend place uh, up in the Berkshires. And there was a small bedroom there that where I had my Bernina on a, a small desk. And I did have the cutting table that that's sort of been around for a while. Um, but what I knew I needed from that experience was more space for the full, more space on the back of the sewing machine, which is why the giant sewing table is just such, such a dream. Um, you know, in the city, it, I was working on the kitchen counter and then moving stuff, closing stuff up. And the biggest gift is to be able to have a space of your own that you can leave projects in, in mid project stage, not have to worry that you have to switch over and use the space for something else. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it, it was it's thinking about being more thoughtful about room for the to hold on to the quilt on the other side of the Bernina. Um, and then having room for a long arm was you know, something I certainly didn't have before. Yeah. It is amazing that you fit that into that small space. <laughs> I'm sure people are thinking. Hmm, maybe I can get a long arm now. You can, you can. <laughs> um, one person asked, Cassandra asked, uh, I see those colorful pieces on a ledge. Has that ever accidentally fallen over? <laughs> <laughs> not yet, because the, the, we, the angelic dog that we mentioned, the, the cat's not so angelic. Or we yeah. have younger generation of cats now, so they don't come up here. They'd be like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jackson's. So no, so far, so far, so good. <laughs> I was thinking that too. My cat would just. Um, let's see. I'm not sure. I think some of these are for Eleanor. Um, do you find that the adhesive still? Not sure what Jane is referring to about applique hold during storage. Oh, do you find that the adhesives hold during storage for applique? Absolutely. Misty Hughes is magic. Um, a lot of people worry that, that you can't fold fabric up once you've Misty Fused it. 
but all of those fabrics and that little rainbow along the cutting table have already been fused and folded back up. Oh, good. I could share pictures. It's hilarious. I have like Misty Fuse parties where I just crank up some Motown and it's just a whole afternoon or a whole morning of fuse lay down. <laughs> lay down. You have multiple goddess sheets, as Iris calls them, and uh -huh. just press, lay up to sort of cure, press, peel, press, peel. Um, but it's really worth doing that because then it's ready for you. And the only thing to do is if you are not familiar with Misty Fuse, if you're in a warm climate or if it's summertime anywhere, uh, it'll take a little longer. So wait at least half an hour before you fold it up. Yeah, I love Motown too, Mary. <laughs> I think we've got a Zoom party in the making, just like a Misty Fuse party where everybody brings everything they need to... Um to uh, adhere and let the Motown tunes rip. Um, yeah, someone mentioned the sound and that's, she said, isn't, Jessica asked, isn't your house overwhelmed with the sound when you work, especially with the long arm? Um, I think you yeah. talked about that a little bit. It's, some, it's something that probably most people don't think about when they're designing their studio, um, you know, the acoustics. Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's interesting, but the Bernina being nested in under half under this sort of slanted ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, I hope that it doesn't make noise. I don't think it makes very much noise. That's my quiet machine. Um, this, um, this person asks, uh, what is your favorite tool? Great question. Oh. Well, I think my new favorite tool, I mean, I, I've got my, my little things I have to have right to hand, and then I have bigger things. So two little things I would share that should have been in everybody's Christmas stocking, and if they weren't, and, and this is not, a, you know, a, a paid ad, they weren't sent to me, they were, I mean, Heidi's a friend, um, Karen Kudlow, she's amazing, she's like rock and roll. Um, but since I do a lot of raw edge fusible, and I trim the edges after I sort of, you know, heavily stitch around the edge and then rough it up and then trim. And so Karen K. Buckley scissors, absolutely must have. And Heidi Perfetti does these scissors, I forget what she calls them, exceptional scissors, or, um, on her website, HeidiPerfetti.com. But they're very, very sharp. I don't know if you can see just how pointed they are. Laura, your audio is dropping out just a little. If you could speak a little bit louder or get closer, that'd be great. I'm so sorry. These okay. is, is that better? Yeah. Um, these tweezers are awesome for fusible applique um, or if you're using a digital cutter for peeling pieces off. Yeah, they're nice and long. We get to the big tool. The digital cutter is a new, thing, a new entrant in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, Cricut Maker is able to connect with my iPad through Bluetooth. So I don't use a laptop. Um, so you can draw shapes in Procreate, which I love. I've written a lot about using the Procreate app to do shapes and then basically beam them to the Cricut via Bluetooth and it'll cut for you. So it can save an enormous amount of time, again, if you're into applique. So I, I love that digital cutter. Mm. Well, here, this brings us to another question from Jan, which I think is a good point about studio, a uh, good question about studio design. How do you manage the electrical in your space? <laughs> oh, there is a giant surge protector under this desk, actually two, uh, that have multiple things plugged in. Elliot is pretty much a genius at figuring out how to sort of snake things under. So, I mean, this house, after, unlike the city where it was a real challenge, this house has plenty of outlets. Mm -hmm. It's about getting them so that you don't trip over them and that they're out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's multiple, you know, the surge protectors that have the multiple um, sockets are yeah. fantastic for that. And you don't, um, so you're both working in the same space. I think you said that at the beginning. Did you? Um, so someone asked how you uh, handle people coming, uh, other members of the family coming in and out of the space, but you have that sort of a divided workspace up there, but not yeah. divided acoustically, but divided um, space-wise. 
Right. So the, the dog goes back and forth. He hangs with Elliot and then he comes over and he hangs with me and he has a bed on each side. Um, <laughs> You know, that's a big part of a nurt that uh, our pets are a big part of a nurturing studio. I know for me working from home, I've worked from home before the pandemic, but, um, you know, having a cat jump up in your lap or, you know, being there sitting on beside your sewing machine to draw. I know in Jean Wells studio tour, her cat gets up on the table and she talks about that, uh, the story of the cat. But I think, you know, with three cats and a dog, they sure are part of your, um, you know, what feeds you at home, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the previous generation, I mean, Jesse, when he was, when he was still with us, he was an older cat. He was quiet. He was always here. He was always here. And he, I have pictures of him posing on every cat quilt and you know, I do a lot of cat quilts and he always seemed to have a peeved expression when he wasn't the subject of, of the court. <laughs> Cats have no manners. <laughs> they don't worry about that. Um, Sharon asked, what if you want to work on a bigger piece in your space? Do you have any, do you take it into another room or how do you accommodate that? Do you pull that table out? That is a great question. Um, one thing I am lacking is a big design wall. And it doesn't bother me so much because I hate working big. You know, the, the sort of every year, I, well, not every year, a lot of years I, I do my annual sort of, you know, exercise and humiliation and try to submit to Sakwa. I've been in once. You know, and typically I aim for like 30-ish by 45 inch pieces. I don't like to do bigger than that. Um, so that will just barely fit on that design, rolling design wall, just. Um, I have been known to put the fabric on the long arm and then roll the pressing table underneath so that that creates mm -hmm. extra work surface. So there was one piece that I did where there were a lot of inks involved and a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of um, fabric inks and then spray bottle and I covered the, the pressing table with plastic, rolled it underneath. And between that and the handy cool book, I had a bigger table surface. So it's Brilliant. a little improvisation each time. Or sometimes it's on the floor if, if it's a big piece painted. <laughs> yeah, clever. Well, you, you, you make do with what you, um, what you have in your space. And, and it is a good design problem to have to keep yourself constrained. But you, you have such a lovely space. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, I know we've got way more questions than we can answer. So I would suggest that folks follow up with Laurie either via social media or is there a contact page on your website? There is, and I'm at Laurie at neonkittyquilts.com. Yeah, so, so follow up with Laurie if you have another, uh, have a question that didn't get answered. But thank you so much, Laurie. I'm going to share my screen so that I can show um, our, uh, our contact information. If anybody would like to uh, get a hold of us, just send an email to information at quiltalliance.org or visit us on our website. I'm Amy Milne. My colleague is Emma Parker. Uh, you can't see her on the call, but she's with us today. And our other colleague is Debbie Josephs. We're glad to help you with anything. Uh, we hope you'll become a member uh, for the cost of what? Three yards of fabric. You can be a member for a whole year and receive a subs uh, subscription to StoryBee and all our other content. And um, thank you for joining us today for Textile Talks. We do this every Wednesday with um, one of our partners. There are six organizations in the group. We take turns and uh, it's a great way to come together and get that vitamin P because we really do need it right now. And I hope you're taking care, staying home, staying well and uh, staying connected everyone. Thank you. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you, Amy. Bye.